Well, it was weak global cues and developments surrounding the India-Mauritius tax treaty that spooked sentiment on the Lal Street. You also had a rise in the US 10-year yield. Gold prices have been moving higher, so equities gave back a little bit. The Sensex lost nearly 800 points. The Nifty lost over 200 points. However, the frontline indices ended flat for the week. On Editor's Roundtable, we decode the key expectations from the fourth quarter earnings. We also take a look at the advantages for Biocon after UK regulators' approval came in for its weight loss drug. We will discuss why distributors are performing better than product makers. We'll also tell you why global market observers continue to be bullish on India despite the concerns on the globe. I'm Sonia Shanoi and joining me, Nimesh, Nigel, Ekta. We also have Pankaj Murarka, the CEO and CIO at Renaissance Investment Managers. Folks, uh, well, it's been a really action-packed week despite having that midweek holiday. Uh, Friday was not great. You the markets come off a little bit and there are now some global concerns that are emerging, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. So what has Friday done, Sonia, is uh, it means that for the for the week, the Nifty and the Sensex are flat. So we gained for the first two days. We had a midweek holiday and on Friday we just gave up everything. So literally in flat uh, from, a, from, a, from a market perspective. But as you rightly pointed out, you know, now there are some fresh concerns on the global market. The bond 10-year has, has crossed 4.5. And again, you know, the feedback from the from the city is not every asset class can go up, right? Crude is going up, metals are going up, gold is going up, and equities are going up. Generally, it doesn't happen. So something has to go up. Maybe this is a week when equities have given up a bit. And and far par for the course, right? We've rallied so hard. Markets have been the best performing market globally as well. So a bit of correction was around the corner. It was a Friday as well. So maybe a bit of profit booking as well. And it's going to be interesting to see what the Fed is going to do next, yeah. right? When we came into 2024, we said in March, there is that outside in, chance that they now, will cut. No. Then it was June. June. Now it is September. Exactly. Know, exactly. So, so, <laughs> you're just kicking the can down, but exactly. it's okay. <laughs> Talking about the macros, we have the India CPI data which is yes. out this evening and it's going to possibly be a sub 5% figure. So I think that will be important to watch out for from an India context. Yes, it's this figure and then we have Brent at $90 per barrel. So that's probably going to change the dynamics. But for now, that should be a good figure. Absolutely. And there's some concern. Pankaj, thank you for joining us on the show. Uh, now people are sitting up and saying, okay, you know, gold prices are rising. The US 10-year yield is rising. The geopolitical concerns. Should we be worried about this rally halting? What's your view? I don't think so. I think we are in the middle of a bull market. It's a matured bull market, but having said that, it's a ferocious bull market. When we say that India is the best performing market, I think there are fundamental reasons for it, right? In an environment where global economies are challenged, half of Europe is already in recession, and the other half will slip into recession during the course of this year. India is an outlier with 7%, 7.5% growth. So, I, and if you look at uh, valuations from a broader, broader market perspective, we are still very much in line with last 15 years' averages. So the point I'm trying to make is that the rally in Indian markets is very much supported by underlying fundamentals. There could be pockets of froth, especially in mid and small cap, where one should be careful. But otherwise, I don't feel concerned about the larger broader market. I still think this bull market has a long way to go. My assessment, we started this bull market in March 20, right? The first day of the lockdown was the bottom of equity markets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we are four years into this bull market now. Yeah. My assessment, we are somewhere in the mid-cycle of this bull market. Mm -hmm. So we still have second half of this bull market to play on. Okay, we are somewhere in the mid-cycle well, of this, this bull be market. This to the years, right? Yeah. I mean, middle of the bull cycle, so I, that's But super. you know, actually, to be honest, despite all the, uh, you know, negativity around global markets, Indian market observers are still very bullish in India. We'll talk about that later. Absolutely. But as we kickstart the earnings season uh, for the fourth quarter, Nimesh, you've put together some data for us. Yes, so, you know, this I've been doing for the last uh, few quarters now that before the earnings season, I just put out a piece on what to expect in, in quarter four. So, first, the, uh, let, let, let me put out the headline numbers first. It's going to be a tepid on the top line, but on the margins, it's going to be the fifth quarter of, of margin expansion for, for a large part of the companies. In fact, the margin expansion could be 115 to 150 basis points. That's the consensus among brokerages. Now, uh, revenue growth of 5%, EBITDA growth of 11%, and PAD growth of 9%. So both EBITDA and PAD largely in double digits. So that's, again, a good thing as far as earnings are concerned. In terms of sectors, uh, consumer decisionary and industrials are largely set to outperform. So that's, that's the overall picture. Now let me come to the individual sectors. First is technology. We, uh, you know, it was expected that on, on, a, on, a, on a constant currency uh, terms, the top five companies are going to report a muted, uh, muted revenue growth. TCS was, was, was the case for that. But Infosys and HCL Tech's guidance will be the key for the uh, technology sector. Coming to the banks, now again, that's a large sector, but the commentary on, on the NIM could, will be a very important thing. Last quarter also we said that there will be NIM compression. So what, how much further is what we need to see in terms of commentary for banks? Within the autos, it's going to be a very, very strong quarter. So 20 to 40% pad growth is expected for the OEMs. And again, the guidance will be pretty much key there. 
energy, another large sector and lot of stocks have outperformed as well. For the OMCs, it's going to be a strong quarter, largely on back of higher refining margins as well as inventory gains. Even the city gas companies are going to do a good volume growth. But to me, the stock to watch would be Gale because that's going to be a big beneficiary uh, on the gas price. So that's something to watch out for. Uh, cement, sequentially a bit of a decline in terms of uh, EBITDA pattern. Metals, again, going to be a, a soft in terms of volume growth, so not much to expect there. Even in pharma, it's going to be quite mixed. The domestic will do well, but within the uh, U.S. Uh, markets, the, the, the sales uh, except relevant would be very important to track. So, again, it's going to be a, a bit mixed as far as pharma is concerned. Capital goods are very, very strong quarter across the board. In fact, most of them are expecting a 20 to 30 percent bad growth for most of the uh, capital goods companies. And the last one is consumer staples. Again, it's going to be a very soft, tepid quarter, you know, mid to single digit growth for, in terms of volume growth for the uh, consumer name. So, again, not much fireworks there. Now, let me come to the, some individual names and stocks now. City puts out this note every quarter and they give, they give some positive and negative surprises. In the positive surprises, watch out for Maruti. A uh, higher operating leverage would mean there could be a big surprise on the margin. So that's something to track. ICC Bank can again surprise uh, in terms of growth. Uh, so, so that's something on the positive side. Ambuja Cement could be a big surprise on the cost efficiency. So watch out for Ambuja Cement on that. Excite, uh, all co commentary on uh, the lithium plant would be very important to track for Excite. And Namura, of course, uh, all the wealth businesses have done well. So expect Namura to report good numbers. However, there are going to be some negative surprises as well. City believes that one of the big negative surprises could come in m, &M. And that's because of the uh, product mix, there could be a margin impact as well. So that's something to track in m, &M. Page is again expected to report a subdued quarter in terms of volume growth as well. Titan, there is a risk of further competition from the, from the payers. So there could be some margin pressure on that as well. Dr. Reddy's decline in the US base portfolio could be a bit of a drag. And HDFC Life can report a negative surprise in terms of VNB margin. So these are a few negative surprises as well. But as I said on the headline, uh, a, a tepid uh, top line growth, but a big expansion in margins is going to continue in quarter four as well. Okay. Well, uh, you know, Pankaj, I just want to bring that point forward about margin expansion because now we are dealing with uh, bread crude at $90. We are dealing with commodity prices which have risen as well. Metal prices are on the rise. Do you think that this margin expansion is probably just going to be limited to this quarter and next quarter onwards we're probably going to see pressure? Yeah, I think so because uh, all through this year we have significant, we've had significant margin expansion across sectors. So mm. probably now we'll have the base effect also kicking in. But having said that, I still think we'll have very strong uh, revenue growth going on to the next year because I remain pretty optimistic on outlook for growth. <laughs> if you look at this quarter's numbers, what is struggling from what uh, uh, he was mentioning, Nimesh was mentioning, is you'll have the best quarter from capital goods companies mm. and the, one of the sectors which will have the worst quarter is consumer companies. And it's a reflection of how the uh, it has been post-COVID. Yes. Uh, Big shift I, from consumer to manufacturing. Exactly. Yeah. I've been saying this this decade in India, the growth is led by investment cycle. So capital goods as a sector will be the best performing sector. And consumer as a se sector will be the worst performing sector. And if you just relate it to uh, what was the case last decade, the previous decade was exactly the opposite. opposite yeah. Because, because the, the decade was led by consumption and the investment cycle was completely missing. Okay. So, so I see, uh, I still see margin gains coming for companies going into the next year, but I think those margin gains will come from operating leverage than from uh, raw material price corrections. Okay, got it. Uh, so we are also going to talk about a lot of specific stocks, right? And as we were telling you earlier, Biocon has risen almost 10% from the time they got approval for diabetes and weight loss drugs in the UK and uh, at the end of March, right? So how big is the opportunity? <laughs> Well, yes, it's a big opportunity for Biocon, which has got approval for uh, liraglutide, which is one of those GLP drug inhibitors, um, you know, in the UK market. So the UK has approved liraglutide. It's the first generic company to get the nod for this particular drug. It's a diabetes market size of around $425 million, and it's the first company to get approval for it. Now, in terms of the entire GLP-1 drug, uh, you know, landscape, around 8.8 .8 million people are using this drug. The market size is expected to hit $100 billion by 2030. Now, what exactly is going to be the opportunity for Biocon? They could probably uh, get around 5% market share from this particular drug and 30 to $40 million in terms of revenue. Uh, they probably want to expand going forward as well into this particular space and uh, that would be an important opportunity to watch out for. Well, uh, let's in fact, <coughs> let's in fact, uh, you know, discuss this a little more with Pankaj. 
Uh, Pankaj, what's your sense in terms of Biocon and, uh, you know, what can they probably expect from this particular drug uh, going forward and GLP-1 drug inhibitors? GLP is a big blockbuster in US. If you see Vigovi in terms of what has happened to the Alilili market cap and no one knows what is market cap, it's just phenomenal. So I think these are blockbuster drugs. If Biocon gets approvals, then it can certainly change fortunes for Biocon. As it is, it's been struggling for almost three years now. Uh, so I think it can have a significant impact if Biocon can really get going on this. Anything else yeah. in the Pharma news? Because there is a big report on uh, Shinjin and Newland and all from Goldman today. So I am a Parma bull on okay. the whole contract research story. Okay. Because if you look at the whole overall contract research, I think India, my view, I started my career as an IT analyst okay. way back in 90s. I think this whole contract research space is exactly where IT was in India in mid-90s. Mm. Oh. We have a strategic advantage. You want to hire a graduate or a postgraduate mm. in chemistry or biology. The same guy in US will cost you <laughs> $300,000. The same guy in Bangalore or Hyderabad, you can hire for $50,000. There's a huge cost arbitrage. Correct. That can be split between companies here and the customers here. Mm. So with the same dollars, the global pharma companies can get more out of it. That was a starting point in terms of economics for IT services company when India was not a proven destination. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think you have the same set of strong economics for contract research. So there's no reason why, and given the kind of talent supply we have, yeah. uh, in as much as we produce the highest number of IT engineers in the world, software engineers, mm -hmm. we also produce the highest number of graduates and postgraduates in chemistry and biology in the world, which is oh, we wow. have not done a good job of marketing ourselves. Sure. By the way, what, since what you track IT, in that space? Yeah. Huh? what are you betting on in that space? So we like all of these companies at this point okay. of time. We like Sinjin okay. uh, because Sinjin broader basket. Company? Yeah, okay. we own Sinjin in our portfolio. We've been, okay. we've held it for a long period of time. Okay. Uh, I'm personally an investor into the company right from their IPO in 2016. Oh. Okay. So I, 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 it has all the ingredients. I, I've said this. There's no reason why Sinjin should not be a large cap over the next 10 years. Sure. Mm. <laughs> Meaning, I did not have had that wisdom to see through 20 years when Infosys was a small cap. Okay. But now I can relate to it. And <laughs> In <laughs> hindsight, it's 2020 as they say. Talking yeah. about Infosys, and you briefly mentioned tech also, I think. What about TCS? It's given us, uh, you know, they've come out with their set of numbers. The top line was more or less in line. Margins was a bit of a surprise. Your view on the tech pack and, uh, you know, how would you approach it? The large cap names may not grow as much, but they have great balance sheets. While the mid cap companies, they could grow at a faster clip, but valuations as well are demanding. Your take. So, Nigel, let me break this in two parts. One, I think we are the worst is clearly behind IT companies. Okay. So, from here on, we'll start seeing every quarter we'll see improvement. The last, this quarter will be more about margin improvement. But I think from the first quarter onward, we'll start seeing revenue traction coming in. Okay. The key highlight for me in TCS results is uh, uh, another quarter of very record order books, mm. 13.5 billion dollars. And for the full year, they've had the highest order book ever in their uh, life at 43 billion dollars. Yes. All of this will f start flowing into the revenues from next year onwards. So I think the worst is behind for IT. So I am constructive on IT. More importantly, from my experience of last 26 years, because I, again, I go back to my early days in 90s as IT analyst, uh, my expectation or my view, and this is corroborated by a lot of CEOs of IT companies that I talk to, they believe that this whole IT spend wave that we'll see over the next five, seven years, which will be driven by AI, mm -hmm. this will be bigger than any wave that we've seen in the last 30 years in the IT industry. So All of us are grossly... In India, who will Sir? capture within the companies? Who so what happens is, see, whenever you have a new innovation in uh, mm. the technology sector, the innovator makes a lot of money. So okay. let's say when enterprise happened, SAP and Oracle yeah. became multi-billion dollars companies and right. they were big beneficiaries. But then all of this technology or innovation has to be implemented. Mm. Mm. When it comes to implementation, Indian companies dominate that because 70 percent of implementation is driven. Generally. Indian companies have 70 percent market share in global implementation. Correct, right. correct. So. so you have implemented, uh, you have, someone has innovated Innovate. GPD, let's say. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then that G you need companies will have to it. build use cases around it right. and will have to implement. Any company not implementing AI or not investing into it over the next five or seven years, my view, however big they are, they are risking their survival 10 years out. Basically, oh. Nimesh is just trying to ask you, what will be the emphasis for the next 20 years? <laughs> in hindsight, if you wanted to buy emphasis, so after 20 so years, what should I, I, I think Infosys will be the emphasis for the next Correct. 20 years as well. <laughs> <laughs> but having That's said that, there, there can be more Infosys. Yeah. 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 There yeah. not Because there are so many opportunities, there will not be only one Infosys. Correct. Which All I'm saying, if... Sector which will probably result in that, you know, producing... IT services, talent. I think IT services. These Within companies are IT really at the cusp of it. Because okay. uh, as a thumb rule, what happens in IT is if the innovator takes, let's say, 20 rupees of revenue, 
the implementers make 60 odd rupees of revenues. Mm. The innovators, uh, the implementers make 3x the revenue the innovators make. Okay, yeah. interesting. All right, I'll come back to you. You know, in the last one year, distributors in various sectors have outshined the manufacturers. What does that mean, Nigel? And you have some data that you've put together. Well, the distributors and the aggregators, they have done better than the OGs. You know, the original gangsters, so to call it. <laughs> now, the producers, manufacturers. Let's get to the wall and, uh, you know, explain this in further detail. I'll just pull up three charts. You know, three charts and you'll see that in various cases, some of these distributors or aggregators have done much better. Case number one, you have all the burgers and, you know, pizza companies. They have not done as well as Zomato. That's point number one. Point number two, I'm talking, look at insurance companies. PB Fintech has done much better than some of those insurance companies as well. And point number three is, DMART has done very, very well. And some of those FMCG companies, well, they are struggling. So clearly the distributors, the aggregators, they are done much better. Let's run you through the potential reasons out there. Few of them should come up for you on the screen. The pizza market, for example, it's around the 8,000, 8,300 crore market. You know, just a short while back, you know, a few years ago, the local or the regional chains, they had close to around 15% of the total market. That's jumped up to around 30%. Yes, Domino's is the dominant player there, close to around 5,000 crores of the total pie. But, you know, it clearly shows that localization and, and regional chains, they are making their presence felt. And the delivery is growing at a faster clip in comparison to dining. So the play out there has to be Zomato, right? The other factor that's playing out is distributors can adapt to the cons customer preferences. You know, you have so many of these new brands that are being showed on uh, Zomato that you want to give them a shot. And the customer is willing to experiment and the distributor is willing to, uh, you know, have uh, some of those uh, companies on their app which is telling you why, in fact, you're know, seeing a great amount of demand of, for some of these local players, so to call it. The other few points that I want to look at. Tremendous potential for distribution to grow. What is HUL's reach? Close to 8 million to 9 million. What is Avenue Supermart's total number of stores? 365 odd. So there's a tremendous potential for Avenue Supermart's out there to add more number of stores and obviously grow their business. The competition is inevitable, but it could be delayed. This point is because of PB FinTech. Everyone's worrying there's going to be a big disruption. Yes, there will be a disruption, but maybe now it'll be a couple of years ahead. The sheet was factoring it a little bit earlier. So that's what's worked in their favor. And also new, uh, new businesses are getting added to the current business. Case in point being a DMART. If you've gone to there, I've looked at some videos on Instagram as well. They're talking about pizzas. You know, there are some adjacent businesses that they've got into, like say pharmacy as well. So because the balance sheets are so good of some of these players, it's helping them get into business adjacencies. And finally, let's wrap this down as well. The management commentary has been good. Some of these companies, they were talking about growing the top line, but not focusing on profitability, not focusing on the return ratios. Suddenly, that seems to have turned, and that's turned in favor of them. And finally, if I have an app, you know, I don't want to download apps of various other players. I'll say, I, for example, I have a Zomato, or I have a Blinkit. If you go and blink it right now, you'll see there are so many Navratri offers, so to call it. Few, a month or so ago, you, you were getting holy colors. You were getting those white t-shirts that you want to use as well. So adaptability, uh, agility, and ability to, you know, reinvent is something that's holds some of these players in good stead. So it explains why some of these distributors or aggregators have actually outperformed the OGs. Uh, Pankaj, I wanted uh, your view on it. I mean, what's your view? Some of these companies, people were not really interested in. And suddenly they have come back, and they have come back in style. Your so, view on it. If you look at the industry structure, the manufacturing sector is fairly organized. When you talk about lever, let's say, when you talk about soaps, shampoos, uh, and let's say toothpaste, so 70% of that sector is already organized, and lever has like 50 to 70% market share in each of the segments. Yes. Mm. But the distribution is completely fragmented Correct. because you have millions and millions of Kirana stores. So, what a DMART is doing when they open a store, obviously, they do cannibalize business from local Kirana stores. Yeah. Right? So what we are seeing here in the distribution space is a shift from unorganized to organized. Mm. Or when a Blinkit or Instamart or, a, uh, you know, when they are growing, they are obviously mm. eating into the business of local Kirana stores by opening dark stores and so on and so forth. Yes. So we are seeing a massive consolidation in the distribution or in the entire distribution value chain, mm. right from, let's say, the CNF to the uh, retail store where the customer steps in and with home deliveries and all of that. And this is happening across sectors. You take pharmaceutical distribution where you have organized chains coming in. You take food yeah. and grocery. You take lifestyle and beauty and all of that. As these players get organized, what has also happened is now some of these players have got critical mass. By virtue of which, they are trying to extract a higher piece of the value chain from the manufacturer. Yeah. Versus otherwise what a, a small distributor can extract from a manufacturer. So there is also a shift in pricing power with larger distributors because they have larger scale. They have a stronger balance sheet and they have a bigger, bigger muscle to negotiate much better with a lever or with 
all of these players. Okay. So there's a shift in value as well that's happening. That and seeing. the fact remains that still these guys have, uh, organized distributors still have a very low uh, market share of the whole distribution yeah. pie that exists. Correct. Meaning Correct. you talk about, let's say when you talk about pharmaceutical distribution, when you look at US, there are two large distributors. Mm -hmm. And then they distribute uh, to the entire country. In India, you still have like millions and millions of lakhs of mm -hmm. CNF and distributors. And untapped potential yeah. as well. Okay. Yeah. So we'll do one thing. We'll take a short commercial break. On the other side, we'll you know talk about the demographic dividend play, right? And the fact that are we at a mature stage yet? And how can India capitalize on it? More on that coming up in a bit. Welcome back to Editor's Roundtable. Well, we're asking the big question, why are global market observers still so bullish on India despite all the volatility globally? Uh, so let's look at a couple of uh, viewpoints, right? Jeffrey says that greed, uh, that India is the best equity story in the world with a 10-year view. Morgan Stanley's Rhythm Desai yeah, says India continues to be in the midst of an earnings upcycle. While Goldman Sachs' uh, Sunil Call says that India remains one of the best compounding markets in the region. Now, the big play really is the demographic dividend in India. India is one of the most youngest populations in the world, right? Uh, in 2023, the median age in India was 28 years. In comparison, in 2023, the median age in China, for example, was 37 years. It was 45 in Western Europe and 49 in Japan. So a demographic dividend, of course, benefits a nation in a big way. But how long does it take? If you go back to China's demographic dividend that ended in the mid-2010s, uh, China took full advantage of this 9 to 10 percent annual growth rate for three decades. So are we at a mature stage of the demographic dividend play for India or not? Uh, where is young India really spending their money, right? You're seeing a surge in travel, tourism, airlines, delivery platforms, a surge in luxury cars, real estate market. Uh, hence, you're seeing a lot of these stocks, whether it's Interglobe Aviation, Indian Hotels, United Spirits, Zomato, all hit fresh record highs this week. Uh, stocks like m and hit fresh record highs this week as well because SUVs have been doing very well. But the big question we're asking, when will India's demographic dividend peak and have we reached a mature stage? If you look at the recent statements from Dharmendra Pradhan, who is uh, India's Minister of Education, he said that the demo demographic dividend will peak in 2041 and the demographic dividend is expected to persist all the way till 2055. Uh, at to, in 2041, the share of the working age population is expected to hit 59%, which is the age of 20 to 59 years. Now, Pankaj, I wanted your thoughts on this. Uh, you know, we were talking about how a demographic dividend plays fine, but is India really capitalizing on it? Your thoughts? I, I certainly think uh, we can do much better than that. If you look at any ecosystem, the two big drivers of growth are your labor force 
And second is the productivity gains, where the same people doing much more work. Uh, if you look at the Western world, where the demographics have peaked, their US or Europe, their growth is largely driven by productivity gains. So whenever new technology happens, they get productivity gains, and that is how they drive their growth. India, uh, now that China's demographics have peaked last year, India is the only large economy in the world where we have a long tailwind of demographics. As you rightly said, our demographics, we have a long cycle of demographics. We have about a million people joining our labor force every month. So effectively, we are adding 10 million people to our labor force every year. And we are the largest supplier of labor to the world for the next 20, 25 years. It's very important. Any country which has gone through this uh, uh, huge demographic uh, transitions, yeah, yeah, has uh, transitioned that economy from a low income or a middle income economy to a high income economy, provided you reap those benefits and not fritter away those demographic uh, dividends. You have to make the most of it because mm -hmm. demographic tailwind is not everlasting. Some point of time, as you rightly said, we'll peak out in 2025, but 2055. Do think, but do you think India is capitalizing on the demographic dividend A and from a stock market angle, how much more do you think we can play this? So one, I think we are still not fully capitalizing on our demographic dividend because we are still not generating enough number of jobs in relation to the number of people who are joining our labor force. I mean, we need to add 30,000, we need to create 30, 30,000 jobs every day, including Saturdays and Sundays. Mm. Yeah, it doesn't matter because demographics don't look at weekends, yeah. okay? Uh, because people are born, you have people being born on Saturdays and Sundays, so people who were born 20 years back, they are turning a day older every day. So every day we have 30,000 people joining a labor force. Mm. You have to create 30,000 jobs. We are not creating that number of jobs. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we have to move these people from low productivity, low income jobs mm -hmm. to higher jobs. One of the biggest challenge facing India is we have to manage the transition from rural to urban. We want more people coming to urban areas. Yeah. We want people moving from agriculture. We have a large part of India's population which is into agriculture. Agriculture, because of lack of mechanization in India, is low yielding and low income generating. Mm -hmm. We need to migrate these people to manufacturing and services where revenue generation or their contribution to growth or productivity will be much higher. Mm -hmm. So not only we need to create more jo jobs, but we need to create more skilled jobs where we can migrate these people. It's, it is going to be economic, it's going to be one of the biggest economic, economic miracle challenge. if we can pull this off. Uh, uh, and it's very important that we make the most of it. Correct, correct. Okay, that's something to think about, right, over the weekend. So, guys, Saturday and Sunday yeah, also, exactly. remember that. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, babies only are born on Saturday and Sunday. Saturday will go up. <laughs> I'll, I'll have the consumption. <laughs> you guys work on Saturday and Sunday, we'll consume. And I have gone ahead and I've upped my SIP as well. The only thing is Sonia mentions it a lot in her post that, you know, you up your SIP. So, this week I've gone ahead and upped my SIP. So, I'm participating on that front. Power of compounding. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Pankaj, for joining us. It was really pleasure, a pleasure listening listening to you and have a great weekend and you Thank folks you so as much. well uh, enjoy your weekend we'll be back with you bright and early on monday morning